evening, Graham Rawlins with our Friday edition of News Geelong. March is the month for Red Cross Calling, as the annual campaign was launched by former Geelong football club great Doug Wade. Every child in Australia has a right to experience dignity, health, happiness, hope, confidence and opportunity. That's the vision of the I Give a Buck Foundation. And from the world of Geelong sport, Mitch Scoop Cleary will update you with all that is happening in Premier Cricket, GDFL Interleague Football and the AFL NAB Cup featuring our Geelong Cats. While from the weather world, we'll update you on the surf coast and Geelong area weather expected over the next six days. The continued growth of North Torquay means the need for consumer services, such as a new supermarket will provide. Debbie Meany has more. Torquay North and the Quay is developing day by day and in the future we're going to have even more retail available for the residents that are here now and that are coming. I spoke with Martin Duke from the Retailers Association of Torquay about just how this will help the retailers in the area at the moment. For a small um, retail, what we call a neighbourhood shopping centre, it will contain one supermarket and a couple of other little shops is really the design of it. The advantage of that supermarket is that it will stop all the extra people, the extra 10,000 people moving into Torquay North heading into Gilbert Street all at once to try and go shop down there. As you know, Gilbert Street's hard enough to shop in on a Saturday or most days it is now, but you can imagine another 10,000 people trying to fit into that space. Uh, Gilbert Street will remain the centre of town. Uh, it'll have all the banks, post office and all the main businesses and the two supermarkets, but we just needed another one to spread the load a little bit out. Just more for transport, parking reasons and to get people in there. So it's a great uh, positive step to help Gilbert Street, as you were saying. Um, what about things like the local area um, otherwise? How big is this supermarket likely to be? Well, from what I believe, now I'm only going from what I believe, it's not to be a big supermarket. It's only on a small block of land. Um, so it's not a big, enormous supermarket. It's not going to take up lots and lots of house blocks. It's what we'd call a neighbourhood supermarket. Uh, you see them, a few of them in around Geelong and Peter Street and down the bottom there where IGA is. So that sort of supermarket, nothing too big that's going to take up lots of space. Not a lot of car parking space, not a lot of concrete for people to get a lot of heat from. So it should be just a nice visiting place. Excellent. Well, we look forward to the further development in Torquay North. Yeah, it should be good. It really should really be good for the people of the Quay to go just somewhere else and Torquay North just to get somewhere to stop and stop that traffic black up in Fisher Street and on the Esplanade. In Torquay, this is Debbie Meany for News Geelong. Thank you, Debbie. Leopold Lodge was a centre of activity for the launch of the Geelong and Barwon Region Annual Red Cross Calling Month. News Geelong joined the residents of Le Le Leopold Lodge for the important occasion. Dressed for the occasion of the Red Cross launch at Leopold Lodge, the lovely Gwen Pargeter. How are you today, Gwen? Fine, thank you. And you look a very brightly and sprightly 21 today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and how, uh, how is important, Red Cross is a wonderful organisation and no doubt you would have been knowing about Red Cross for a long, long time. Now they've been very, very helpful to me in the last few months. Gwen T has been really helpful. And in what way have they been able to be helpful to you? They've, come in, they've been coming out and visiting me when I need help uh, for various subjects, someone to talk to, someone of like mind that we can really get, get together and chat. And Gwen, an important role, but one you obviously enjoy. I thoroughly enjoy it. I've been very privileged to have Gwen as my person I visit. So the two Gwens together form a formidable pair. That's right, two Gwens together. Another pair at the Royal Cross, Red Cross launch is Ber Beryl and Eunice. How are you, Eunice? Not too bad. Not too bad. And Beryl, you're a regular visitor to Eunice out here at the Leopold Lodge. Yes, yes, I've been visiting Eunice for nearly six years and I am a volunteer at Leopold Lodge as well. March is the month for Red Cross Calling and launching the Red Cross Calling at Leopold Lodge. Number 23 from the Gulf Square, yes, the great Doug Wade from the Geelong Cats. How are you, Doug? Yeah, good, thanks. That's a long time ago. A long time ago. They've given it, a, I think they've given it out this year to somebody else, but hmm. It'll all be no, always known as number 23 for Geelong. Uh, Red Cross has been a very important part of our community over the years, uh, Doug. Oh, it's, a, it's a magnificent organisation. I mean, uh, there's 
It's probably the, the one organisation in the world that everybody knows and, and knows about and uh, is very, very happy to give to. And it's a non-profit organisation that most of the people who run it are volunteers and it's just a fantastic organisation. And you're right, we hear about it at the international level and in times of trouble uh, in war-torn countries, etc. But here in our own community at the grassroots level with volunteers visiting people like uh, the aged uh, at Leopold Lodge, etc., it really it does show the, the true force behind it. Yeah, it does. Uh, my wife, uh, Liz, is, is one of those volunteers uh, who visits uh, older people in, the, in our community. They love it and they, uh, and as you can see around here, that uh, out, out of this uh, community, it's just fantastic that, uh, you know, the Red Cross can come into so many areas and so many lives. It's a wonderful day. It's such a pleasure to be here having our launch at the Leopold Lodge. And the month of March is always Red Cross calling. And how long have you been involved with the Red Cross? I've been in Red Cross for 10 years now. So I've just recently taken over as regional chairman, worked up to that position and uh, thoroughly enjoying this sort of thing that we get to do. And we're asking people to give generously to Red Cross calling this March. People will be going around two doors, uh, knocking uh, for Red Cross calling, and they will be well and truly credentialed so people will know that they're giving to the Red Cross. They certainly will be. They have identification badges and, uh, and official receipt books that they can uh, issue with a receipt. And there's also intersection collections where um, they'll be uh, well posted and um, signed. Uh, we've had a long affiliation with the Red Cross, with the volunteers, and we were very happy to uh, have the opportunity to uh, do the launch um, at Leopold Lodge. For our viewers, uh, when you say uh, you've had a great experience with the volunteers, what do the volunteers from Red Cross uh, do as their interface with the Leopold Lodge? Many of the volunteers come uh, and see some of the residents who don't have families, take them out on uh, short trips and just provide company for those uh, residents and it's uh, very comforting for them. And that's an additional arm of the Red Cross that we don't hear a lot about. It, that's, that's true. We hear about all the other uh, people who help with the major disasters, but this is still an important arm for uh, these uh, people, in, not only at Leopold Lodge, but for all other aged care facilities throughout Australia. Thank you to the Red Cross and best wishes to all our friends at Leopold Lodge. Good on you, Percy Babb. As we go to a break on this Friday edition of News Geelong, don't forget you can Twitter us on our Twitter account at News Geelong 31 with your thoughts and comments. We'll return with more news after this. Welcome back to News Geelong. Hip size may be the link between obesity and premature death, according to new research done at Deakin University. Dibimini has more. A study involving almost 10,000 individuals over 20 years looked at the hip measurements and waist measurements of individuals and how that relates to obesity and premature death. I spoke with Dr Adrian Cameron here at Deakin University about the study. Uh, we've, do, we've done a study which started in Mauritius actually, um, which is an island off Africa about 20 years ago. Uh, and we followed up around about 10,000 people from 1987 um, through to a couple of years ago um, and we measured their waist and hip circumference uh, at the, the baseline in 1987 and followed up and, and uh, looked at who had died over that 20 year period. And what uh, findings are there at the moment indicating that hip circumference is perhaps more significant than just waist circumference? Uh, well, we've known uh, for a while that waist circumference is a, a major risk factor for mortality um, and in the last five years or so we, we've started to get an idea that hip circumference is also important for not just mortality but also diabetes and heart disease um, and the study that uh, we did uh, we looked at the, the effect of waist and hip circumference together on the risk of uh, dying prematurely. Uh, and what we found was that um, if you just look at the waist circumference uh, in this population, which is, is largely Indian population, uh, you only get half the story. Uh, until you look at, at waist and hip circumference together, um, you don't really get an idea of the risk involved with obesity. So who would be at the lower end of the risk scale here? So the lowest end of the risk are people with a smaller waist and, and larger hips. Um, and then you're moving to the higher end of the risk scale are people with very small hips but a bigger waist. And so they're the people who really are at risk of heart disease and, and dying early. And what is the next stage of this study? Uh, so this study's been going for 20 years. Um, we've, been, we've been following up uh, the cohort 
Uh, the study will continue on. Uh, those people will continue to be monitored to see uh, whether they develop diabetes or heart disease or, or whether they die early. And we can look at, so, so far we've looked at 20 year follow up um, and we'll continue, continue that on. At the Deakin University campus at the waterfront, this is Debbie Meany for News Geelong. Thank you, Debbie. A little from many changes kids' lives and the I Give a Buck Foundation believes that every child in Australia deserves to experience joy to live with dignity, as Debbie Meany reports. I'm here at the home of Harry Reid, who's in desperate need of some funds to help them get a new vehicle, uh, to help lift him in and transport him around the place. So I spoke with his family and some members from I Give a Buck Foundation about how we can help. The main problem with us at the moment is Harry's getting older and heavier and uh, we're unable to transport Harry in and out of the car anymore that we've got. And he really requires a car with a wheelchair hoist to make it easier on everyone. <laughs> yeah. um, as you can see, he's growing and he's going to continue to grow. So um, unfortunately, he's outgrown our car, he's outgrown the wheelchair. We're in the process of getting a new wheelchair. and. Um, you know, it's good that he's growing, but it's also causes a few problems. So, his, what what are his health issues? Um, he's got cerebral palsy. <laughs> he has visual and hearing disabilities. Um, microcephaly. He's got a small head. His brain hasn't grown much since birth, and he has intellectual disabilities as well. So, severe developmental delay. So you obviously need some significant funds here. Where yes. are you hoping that's coming from? Well, we're hoping that the local community, the Geelong community, will get together for Harry. And um, we've always found living in a small community like Torquay that it has been supportive. And uh, even some of the local service clubs, if they could get together, Rotary, Lions, some of the major uh, shell, anyone that's got some money that would like to donate, all donations are tax deductible, so, um, mm -hmm. and even just some of the local schools, if they could come on board and have a $1 day, free dress day for Harry, or come up with some ideas to get this community, the children involved, <laughs> helping Harry, because a lot of the kids know Harry from <laughs> Chanduk Preschool, where he attended 13 years ago, so a lot of kids <laughs> will remember yeah. Harry being a special needs boy back then. Yeah. And so, the Bendigo Bank, you've got an appeal going Yes, there's there a, well. an appeal. Um, I haven't got the numbers on me at the moment, but um, there is. you can make donations at any Bendigo Bank. Uh, I give a buck mm. foundation um, with a reference to Harry's appeal. Um, but apart from that, um, just anyone that feels the need that they can help you know, we're appreciative of any help we can get. Right. Well, we're hoping that we can generate a bit of public support from the local Ge Geelong community. Uh, what we do at I Give a Buck is we identify a specific child who has a specific need um, for a specific price. And we've identified Harry as needing a, a wheelchair accessible van. And so we get about fundraising for that a dollar at a time, hence I Give a Buck. Um, and we just believe that, you know, a little from many can really change a child's life. And a little from many, there's probably a significant value here for this vehicle. There is, it's going to be about $50,000, so it's a subst substantial amount of money. Uh, and what we find is that um, we, we can probably start to look at around about 40,000, but we really need probably that 50 to allow us to, um, to really go shopping for a, for a vehicle that's going to have, see Harry for a few years yet. <laughs> in Torquay at the home of Harry Reid. This is Debbie Meany for News Geelong. Thank you, Debbie. Continuing with the great research work being done at Deakin University, a recently completed study has revealed the size of osteoporosis problems in Australia. Debbie Meany has more. Over 3,000 individuals in the Geelong area are currently being studied for osteoporosis. I spoke with Associate Professor Julie Pascoe here at Barwon Health about the study. Men and women from the community have come in to participate in our study known as the Geelong Osteoporosis Study. Um, this study was started in the early 1990s and every few years we ask them to come back and we do a health check for them every few years. And as part of that ongoing study we've been able to measure their bone mineral density and that tells us how strong their bones are. And from those findings um, we see that about 1.2 million Australians have osteoporosis and because of the ageing population this number is set to escalate to about 3 million over the next decade or so um, and a further 
uh, 5.4 million people are living with osteopenia, which is just a, a, um, a deterioration of the bones. It's like a precursor to osteoporosis. And it's a worry that that many people are suffering from fragile bones because, of course, that leads to um, a fragility fractures, such as fractures of the hip. And that can be quite devastating if you fra suffer a fracture of the hip. At Barwon Health, this is Debbie Meany for News Geelong. Thank you, Debbie. As we go to a break, we'll return with sport and weather here on our Friday edition of News Geelong. Welcome back to News Geelong as we move into the world of Geelong sport with Mitch Scoop Cleary. It's getting near the end of the local cricket season and the beginning of football, Mitch. Thanks, Rollo. After having Paran 7 for 82 on Saturday and losing... Geelong Cricket Club coach Damien Shanahan will be hoping for an improved performance in the final round of home and away series of Premier Cricket against Frankston Peninsula. The trip around Port Phillip Bay is crucial for club championship points and for the first 11 after dropping to 7th on the premiership table. So, uh, obviously extremely disappointing that we couldn't get the job done on the weekend and um, you know after such a good start on Saturday having uh, Pran you know six for 70, uh, seven for 80, um, you know you'd really uh, hope that we could win from that position and obviously being one for 60 odd just before stumps on Saturday night we're in a commanding position as well but uh, unfortunately um, we lost the wicket on the last ball of the day and then uh, Bluey Muller Caught one in the jaw um, on, on Sunday morning, and then uh, yeah, we capitulated from there. What's the update with uh, Luke Muller uh, with his injury at the moment? Is he a chance to play this week against Frankston? Yeah, definitely. He's uh, he's come up pretty well actually. He spent a, probably four or five hours in hospital on Sunday. Um, it looked like at one stage it'd probably be a fracture in his uh, jaw line. But uh, it's just a, some uh, nerve damage and some severe uh, bruising, and he's very swollen still. But um, obviously, uh, we're hoping that he'll be available. You lost the first, seconds, and thirds on the weekend. Disappointing to drop down in the club championship. Something you strive pretty highly for. Yeah, we've dropped down a second position in that as well. It was uh, obviously uh, once, twos, and threes losing. It was, it was really disappointing and. It was such a, uh, a build-up situation for us coming into the last two rounds. So, um, you know, we've still got an opportunity to still win it. Um, I suppose uh, Frankston's going to be very hard to get over. Uh, they're a good club and, um, you know, they're a very progressive club as well. So it's going to be a really good challenge to see how boys respond. Uh, Jeremy Hart's had the injury recently. You can you just give us an update on where's he, where he's at and whether he's a chance in the coming weeks? We're hoping so. We're hoping he might be a chance this week. Um, but if not, obviously uh, the week after, the game after for the first final. Um, he's extremely important for us. And, you know, just missing him on Saturday when we had him 7 for 80 just to clean up the tail would have been beautiful for us to bowl him out for less than 100, which would have probably guaranteed us points. But in saying that, um, you know, we're hoping that he'll, uh, he'll be available for the first final. As we turn to AFL football and the NAB Cup clash between Geelong and Gold Coast, which kicks off in an hour's time, Cats coach Chris Scott feels it is a big opportunity for younger players to showcase their talents. We're hopeful that Hawkins will play um, Christens and Cowan, um, but we're just not sure on those guys yet. But um, in terms of the really experienced players, I don't think we'll see too many of those, no. Scott was impressed by the Gold Coast Suns in its opening NAB Cup match against the Melbourne Demons. We know they're going to be a force in 2014, 15, if not earlier. Um, they look significantly better to me. You know, they're, this was a pretty obvious statement to make, but their 19-year-olds look like 20-year-olds this year. I mean, they, they're, they're going to get some natural improvement in terms of physical maturity, but they look to me to be playing um, a more contested brand of footy, um, even than they were last year. So. Um, we think it's going to be a pretty good test. We're going to play a young side and they're obviously a young side as well. New Geelong and District Interleague coach Paul Price is only after committed players in this year's GDFL campaign. As the Raiders look to bounce back after last year's loss, Price said a win will come through a dedicated group. Uh, nice to get back into the coaching. Um, it's something that will be a little bit different having the calibre of player and you know sort of that we're going to have in an interleague capacity instead of a, a club capacity. But hopefully, uh, you know, the squad will sort of get behind what we want to do and really embrace it. 
What have you done up to, up till now uh, in your role? Have you done any scouting over the pre-season at, at local level? Yeah, look, I had a look at last year's final series to see you know what sort of players stood up inside big games, and you know on the finals at St Albans was certainly where you want to stand up. So you can sort of take a line through that too into league, um, and then had a look at a couple of clubs over pre-season. And spoke to some of the coaches just to see if there's any young fellas out there that really deserve, a, I suppose, a spot in the initial squad. The league's gone for a sole interleague coach now and yourself rather than Adam Scrobelak who's done it coaching at both the local side at the same time. Do you feel that's the right step forward at this stage? Yeah, whether it be myself or someone else, you know, we've got the capacity now that we're not coaching a side on our own that we can get out and see a couple of games over a weekend and probably cast a wider eye than you know someone that does have to coach and just see one side per weekend. So Scrub has done a great job with it. Um, but yeah, we've probably got to that stage where if we're fair income as a league and we really want to try and win our division, it needs someone just to float around each weekend, look at different games and see who are the best players can play. There's always speculation whether the best players will play. How do you feel at this stage and have you had any talks with any key players? It's probably been the one that is the hardest. You know, people have said to me, why why would the best players want to play under yourself? Like what, you know, your personal achievements, what is it compared to some of the other coaches going around? And if that's the mindset of the players, they probably won't get selected because you want players to want to play and represent not only the league but represent themselves. You know, you don't know they play well up there in Bendigo, what opportunity, what door opens for them. So we're going to go with a group that want to play and want to represent the GDFL and want to ultimately win our division that we're in. And those that don't, you probably don't want running around anyway. There's always talk whether the GDFL is better than the BFL and Interleague is always a good platform to showcase that. Do you always want to get up there and challenge the BFL? Oh, look, I think that's somebody else's romantic idea. If, um, you know, I'm not going to say one way or the other. I've played across all three leagues. And if you're asking for an honest opinion, uh, you know, Bellarine Premier will beat up you know, most GDFL sides, if not all but GDFL sides. So, yeah, you know, I'm not here to, to throw one against the other. If it came off at the end of the day, great. But if it did, then we would have one winner and people would have to stop talking about it. And that's probably the, the romantic thing, nor the talk than the actual game. The actual league itself have got behind the concept. You know, they want to step out and try and win our, win our division and win our conference. And, you know, we'll send out letters and we'll, you know, ask players, would you be interested in representing the GDFL? If people say no, well then fine, that's the end of it. We're not going to force them. We're not going to drag them to the line kicking and screaming. We want players that actually want to represent their local club, the league and themselves to the best of their ability. And before I hand back to you, Rollo, a quick mention to watch out for former Geelong Falcon, Jai Sheehan, who will line up for the Melbourne Demons in tomorrow's NAB Cup match against Collingwood. But from the world of Geelong sport, it's back to you, Rollo. Thank you, Mitch. And before we leave sport, don't forget the Belmont Lions sign-up day for Auskick under-10s, under-12s, under-14s, under-16s and the Colts, which are the under-18 and a halves, at the Belmont Lions Sports Club Winter Reserve in Kidman Avenue, Belmont, from 1 till 3 p.m. on Sunday. All participants will receive a special Cogsy show bag, so be there. And now for all the weather expected for Geelong and the Surf Coast over the next six days, it's a good evening to our scintillating Sophie Miller. Good evening, Graham. Cool, our windy and wet weather ahead as we take a look at the forecast. Tomorrow, Saturday, will be a cloudy day with areas of rain and a top of 21. Sunday will continue to be partly cloudy with scattered showers and a top of 25. To start off another week in March, Monday will be cloudy with isolated showers continuing with a top of 23. Tuesday will again be partly cloudy with isolated showers and a top of 23. On Wednesday, we can expect partly cloudy periods with a possible shower or two and a top of 23 while Thursday will be partly cloudy with a top of 23. Today we saw partly cloudy periods with patchy drizzle throughout with a top of 22. That's the weather outlook for Geelong and the Surf Coast. Enjoy the rest of your evening, have a safe weekend and it's back to you Graham. Thank you Sophie and thank you for joining us on News Geelong this Friday evening. To the evergreen man in white from both football and cricket, Ray Gurry. Remember Ray, Take your time and smell the flowers. From all the team at News Geelong, enjoy the rest of the evening, have a safe and pleasant weekend and a very good night. <laughs>